I uh, am a huge fan of Brandon's and uh, I'm just so blessed I got to become really good friends with him. And I thank you so much for uh, doing this today. I, I, it is my honor entirely. When I was asked to do this, it was, I, was, I, I still have not absorbed that this is a real thing. Um, should we just get, do we go right into it? Yes. Yeah, yes. All right. Well, you finally joined the ranks of the, the streaming uh, platform. I don't know. I don't know. Is that good or bad? I kind of miss having the DVD cover with that scratchy. <laughs> I haven't seen the movie in forever because who has a DVD player? Last night I tried, I didn't realize, I didn't realize right now when we're recording this, it wasn't streaming and I tried uh, renting it. I had some friends over. I'm like, you guys have to see this. So I spent a good 10 minutes just describing girls will be girls. And um, once we realized we were shit out of luck and couldn't get it, um, and that we all can't wait. So we're very excited. Um, what, uh, is there anything that excites you about seeing this film in high def that, that you couldn't see before? Not for me. <laughs> but I am excited for, you know, now that I'm on Instagram and all these different, you know, I'm older, so it, it's funny to have all these young fans because of the internet now. And so it, a lot of these young people have been asking me, mm. where can I get Girls Will Be Girls? And it's so, it's so nice to finally have an answer for them that they can finally stream it from their own home. So um, that feels really good to, to be introducing this to a younger generation. I think that uh, this film is very timeless. I think that the younger generation, because it doesn't tie itself heavily to anything that, did, you know, I, I, I fell in love with it. At, well, I, I saw it when I was 16, 17. And so I, I, I and it, it totally, I didn't, I grew up in a small town and didn't have access to queer uh, comedy, you know, and so to have, go from cable and then seeing this movie was very mind blowing. And Rose of the Sharks, how the hell did you come across it? I can't, well, I know I came across the sketches first on YouTube. There was sketches that I thought were hilarious. I said, this, and then somehow I, I must have Googled it and found that there was a movie. I don't know if the movie came first and then the sketches followed or vice versa, but uh, I ordered the movie on Amazon. It was the first thing I ever bought on Amazon. I made an account just to buy Girls Will Be Girls. And I had some friends over and I said, well, because we, we all love the sketches. And I said, well, let's see how the movie is. Oh my God! It was a, it was like a, how, how, it was a movie, a theatrically length sketch with the same laughs per minute. I was very impressed, and it has influenced our work ever since. I texted them last night, and I'm interviewing the cast of Girls Will Be Girls. I'm shitting my pants. I can't believe it. So, yeah, I want to ask each of you what uh, top of your head. What's your favorite experience uh, in hindsight about Girls Will Be Girls? We'll start with uh, Coco. Oh God. Um, I just, being trained in the theater, it was wonderful to be around other drag characters where they had the, that sort of background as well, mm -hmm. of, you know, showing up on time, realizing that by allowing you to have your moment, you made the whole project better rather than trying to hog you know, the scene or try to steal focus. I think we all like, you know, are, are fans of each other. So um, it just felt very safe. And I felt very supported, of course, by everyone there, but by also my co-stars. And that's a really great, because uh, you don't always feel that on every project you work on. And that's a wonderful feeling to have, to have that support, because making a movie can be scary and you're vulnerable and all those things. and that was the most important thing to me was to feel safe. Uh, and I know that maybe sounds a little corny, but that is the truth. And also there were a couple of, I don't know what you would call them, tech guys, grips, you know, these straight guys that did like to smack me on the ass every now. Oh. So I did appreciate <laughs> that as well. Oh, grips, a little they horny bastard. That to me. <laughs> <laughs> Are you surprised? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> well, yeah, that, I, I definitely see the theatricality in it. I, all, my, all of my friends who appreciate this film are theater kids. And um, yeah, there is something very um, ostentatious about this movie. Um, it's very absurd in a, in a very good way. Um, Varla, what about, what, what about you? I, 
I had filmed some movies, but they were so low budget. They weren't really with professional people. <laughs> and so to film with Jack and, and Clinton, I mean, I didn't know the things you were supposed to do, you know, at trying to keep your hand movements the same, trying to, I mean, oh. you know, it's so different from theater so that you can give the editor what they need so that they're not, you know, forced to use something terrible because your hand just happens to be right here, you know? And I, I didn't know any of that. I didn't know any of the protocol of filming and, and how you even do it. And I learned so much on that film that, I mean, I was able to do from all the other big films I've made since, <laughs> <laughs> but it was just an amazing experience because they were just so helpful. I, I had no idea really how to film a movie. And, you know, it's funny because um, we were filming the movie and there were all these jokes in it about me being fat. And I thought these are not going to work because I'm not fat. And then um, cut to me seeing the movie, and I was a moose <laughs> compared to them because Clinton and um, Coco and Evie were so skinny, and I just looked, I did I look like a moose. I mean, pretty much they hide. I mean, I'm so much bigger than everyone else, and and Richard, they really hit it. So there's only one scene, and now I'm twice that size. But uh, there's only one scene when we're out. Um, with the Bob Hope nachos where you see me kind of hulking over like this, which is how I really look, you know? And so I was amazed at how they filmed it and could make me look. I mean, you know, a lot of people thought that I was a real woman from that, which is- Yeah, you know, you're the ridiculous. only one people would say to me, they'd go, we, we get that everyone in the, in the movie is a guy, but, but Varla's a, a real woman, right? And I'm like, <laughs> Varla's a freaking football player. <laughs> Yeah, it, but so it was all angry. how it was filmed. It was all how it was filmed. And so, you know, in my but mind, I, I still think that I, I look like Varla in that movie, that I'm this petite little thin sort of thing. And, you know, the reality is I'm not. <laughs> you're acting. I mean, you're, you, you are just so decidedly committed to that you are just this waif and this ingenue <laughs> and you sell it. No, it was great. I just, I mean, I loved how much I learned from on the film. And, and also it was just hilarious. And I lived on the set. I lived there. I lived with Richard. We would drink at night. And then, you know, we'd have to wake up at like four in the morning and I'd be shaving every day. And your, your face is like Hamburger Mary. By the end, there's blood coming through your, your makeup. And you, then you have to shave again later in the day, just around here. I mean, it was, you know, it was just an amazing experience. I, I don't think I've ever worked so hard, but it was really one of the best experiences of my life doing that. I didn't know that, that was your, I, I guess I never asked where that was shot. That, that was, it looks like a Hollywood house up in the hill somewhere, or it wasn't. It, it was. was. Richard's home. That was Every my Every scene practically. Richard, wow. um, there's a story about how uh, his bedroom basically was like six different sets. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was all my house. And that's part of how we were able to do it is when, you know, locations will kill you on a, on a movie or a soundstage. There's no affording one of those. But my house was like where Evie would probably live. This kind of, you know, flat 70s kind of style. Uh, Hollywood, you know, had a little money once a long time ago, but hasn't been able to redecorate. Uh, look, um, and our my bedroom was this big square room and that just became our, our soundstage, our swing set. And it was a hospital room, it was a restaurant, it was a green room, it was Evie's was bedroom. Where the actual swing was? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, that's from the shorts, but yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. And, you know, uh, it was a totally just homemade movie between friends and that's my favorite thing about it because I, I love, um, when I love, I love comedy sketch. I grew up being obsessed with Carol Burnett. I loved men playing women. And so Coco and Varla were just my absolute favorites and I never missed a show they did. And so for me, my favorite part of doing the movie was getting to actually play with them. And the brilliant thing that Richard did was to take these three characters that we'd been doing and, and put them together because he knew that that we would bounce off each other well but on top of that you know Richard's a huge showrunner in Hollywood he was doing all of these mainstream tv shows so my other favorite thing about this film was Richard and I were finally doing our like our real sense of humor which is much darker especially then I mean now there have been some you know, you get the sense now that you can do something like search party, that somebody can have a vision and they'll let them do it. Not everybody, you have to win the lottery, but still, back then, that didn't exist at all, especially for gay people. I mean, you could luck your way onto a 
good show, but it's a good straight show. The idea that we got to do like the gay sensibility. I remember my first, my favorite memory was the first day for that reason, because we'd written it, you know, and we knew we wanted to do it and we knew we were going to do it. But that first day we hired this crew kind of off the internet. I forget how we found whom, but they turned out to really know their shit. And that first day when we were doing, it was the uh, kitchen scene and a dining room scene. And I looked at it on the monitor and the performances were just amazing. And also, you know, I thought it was going to be like a, a YouTube video of myself. Cause I mean, I didn't know what this crew was and wasn't capable of. And I knew we weren't paying them enough to do good work, but I looked at the monitor and went that, that works. That is a, it, it, its own look. I haven't seen that look anywhere else. And the, Actors are great in it, and and, and it was uh, such a thrill to get the material out there, but mainly uh, the, this huge sense of relief, like, it works. It's yeah. going to be good, you know? I mean, I just remember that. And, th and then the joy of, like you're saying, getting to make something that you actually, you know, not care about, but that speaks to you, you know? That, that, that didn't happen back then. I love, too, on the set, we would memorize the script, but Richard would throw in lines. If he didn't think a line was working, he'd just keep throwing lines at us, and we'd do the same scene and do another line, and do and end with another line, end with another line. That was so much fun. And you know what's funny about that, too, is that um, there was a scene set at the supermarket, and what we talked about building all of those sets in the bedroom, and it kind of didn't, like the hospital room doesn't even have a door. We do it with light on the ceiling, and none of these sets, I think, would pass muster in a straight movie or a horror but it's a drag movie so you're kind of just accepting that okay that's the restaurant i'll take that but we built a supermarket in my kitchen and we got and it was the, probably the most expensive and hardest set to do with these shelves and products you had to put them with and they were done at the end of the shooting day i went and looked at it. we were going to shoot it tomorrow and i just said we can't put this on screen it's like it just we bit off more than we could chew it did not there was no way to film these two aisles and have it look like a supermarket so we were stuck suddenly with a shooting day and nothing to shoot. And that's when uh, we improvised and otherwise came up with the astrophysicist scene. And that's oh like my God. favorite scene. I mean, and it was just because the supermarket set didn't work. Wow. Thank God that shitty set didn't go through. <laughs> Physicist. I, uh, that is one of the most quoted uh lines between me and my friends which actually i wanted to ask what is there a line that haunts the three of you uh for better or worse a line that really sticks above the um the rest for for the three of you jack what about you what's what's your well favorite? i just love the offhanded way evie says uh, coco says what is that line richard about the um have you ever taken have you ever had um, you've been on morphine yeah and evie says once uh, when I was, well, what's the line? I'm sorry. When I had my eyes it's done. It's your favorite line. You should know it. <laughs> it's once when I had my eyes, eyes done. Okay, so Coco says, Evie, have you ever had morphine? And Evie says, once when I had my eyes done, and then every day since. And I just, to me, it's just that offhanded way that the, the, this this garbage comes out of her mouth that's so yeah. dark, and she's completely unaware of how she's enlightening you about what a monster she is. Everything that she comes out of her mouth is very sincere and very um, almost motherly wisdom. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. What about what about the two of you? Are there any? Are they? What's your favorite line from? from your own character, uh, Coco. Uh, I often get asked to, st to say, um, still raped over here. Um, so that's usually how I sign the DVD. Oh! So. <laughs> still or never my... mess with the doctor's wife. Those oh, the revenge, revenge line. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. my people all the way, all the time say Maserati. I say Maseratis don't do anal. And the funny thing is now, <laughs> my mother-in-law had a Maserati and she doesn't drive it, so I drive her Maserati. Oh. <laughs> and so people, as bar, like, I've driven, the, and people, I'll get out of a Maserati. So Maseratis do do anal, I guess. <laughs> ground you're you're trailblazing you know because of you varla i can't walk past the cheese whiz aisle and not uh think of uh, emptying half a can down my throat um <laughs> but 
you know, I had done that in my own act and then Richard, you know, wanted to, to put that in, which I, I'm so glad he did because it's just so bizarre. I mean, it makes no sense and I love it. And how many takes do we do? Two or three? I went so long on some of them. I mean, we, I think we did three takes, right? Well, we did two, two or three. It was amazing. We did like, two. Like the idea of even doing one, but I, I know you, and the reason we did the second one was that um, you cut it off earlier than, like it's, I don't think we were going to do the second take. I said, that was great. Or you went long or something, but then you said, oh, I could have gone longer, but I just didn't want people to get bored. And I was like, Varl, you could do that. As long as you can do that, people will be entertained. There's no too long for that bit. So just, the second one we did until you had a signal, like my mouth is filling up and that's when. <laughs> well, you see it filling up. She can't breathe. <laughs> I know. I did something stupid then. I remember that signal and I was like, I'm going to wait another second or two just to see what's going on. Yeah. And I don't think I can. But it does. I like that you can't kind of see it coming out of your mouth. I mean, you follow it all. <laughs> so the three of you have very distinct looks even before this was uh, in production. Who did the costumes, the hair and the makeup? Was it consistent or did the three of you do it yourselves uh, during the production? Well, costumes, everyone was on their own. Again, it was just this homemade thing and we were flying by the seat of our pants and everybody just brought a bunch of clothes with them and we just chose on, on. but makeup was done uh, by a brilliant makeup artist friend of mine named Adam Christopher. And he, he was oh. incredible. He was incredible. You know, it's funny because one of the scenes, I, I went out shopping because there were some, I didn't have a lot of day wear outfits and you know, Varla wears a lot of day wear in there. And so I went to Macy's and bought that blue sweater where I'm in the diner and Ooh. it had the security tag on it. <laughs> and that was not a joke in the movie where you see the security tag under my arm and Richard shows it for just a second, but that I really bought it and it had the security tag on it. Sure. And so I was like at first freaking out and he was like, just wear it. It's <laughs> funny. It's funnier. Is it, that, that, yeah, that, it does look like that's a joke we would do. But it, yeah, but it wasn't. Security tags are just wearable conversation starters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a luxury to have Adam do our makeup. I mean, yeah. you know, we all do our makeup all the time. That was one, that was the big lug, the one luxury of the, the film, I guess. The one I had never had someone do my makeup like that all the time. It was amazing. Because when we did when we did the sequel, uh, we had to do our own makeup, you know. So uh it wasn't the same. I mean it, so he was amazing and he was a great makeup artist and I learned so much about makeup from him that you know I still use yeah oh, there, wow. there were no luxuries on that set I was uh <laughs> like right the day before filming I was running back and forth between Home Depot to pick up wood to nail to Richard's wall and I dropped a desk on my finger uh, unloading at one of the many many trucks and I broke my pinky and you can actually see uh, on the DVD cover of the original release they didn't even like airbrush my my fingers completely broken and you just see that. but uh but it was such an act it was just this this um just work of love of like we get to play and and make something was the dynamic between the three of you similar to what was in, on set where the, what was it like between the three of you i think uh yeah i i, I think when jack and i first met there was a dynamic of me just being like what is this, I didn't know how to deal with Evie. And so when we first performed together, it was real. You know, there was truth in that performance of me just being a bit like, whoa, she's too much. You're, you're invading my space. And, um, and of course it got huge laughs, but it, there was some reality there. And, um, and, but as we all got to, and I, I'd known Varla for years, but I think, but by the time we were working on the film, we were all such good friends. Um, yeah. Yeah. But the and, most and Coco we, moment is when you arrived on set and didn't know you were doing a feature film. Yes. Oh. She thought she was just going to like make a video with Richard. And, and so her first scene, which is me and her in the morning at the table and we're talking, mm -hmm. she's like, well, you, you tell it, Clinton. I was just horrified because I thought when Richard said, we're going to, we're going to make, because I had suggested when Showtime, turned it down. And I really believe that if Showtime had seen us doing it, they would have gotten it. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, why don't we make a video so they have something to see? Um, 
and next thing you know, we book the dates and I show up thinking that we're making, you know, a little video. And there was this crew and, and I remember this big cameras and, and I was completely overwhelmed by it all. And so that first scene I'm shaking because I just thought I, was, I wasn't prepared. Supposed to tell her we were making a feature film. <laughs> what? Who was supposed to tell you we were making a feature film? <laughs> Michael, you dropped the ball. <laughs> so, but anyway, it was a great experience. Since the move, since the production of Girls Will Be Girls, have the three of you kept in touch? And uh, what is your relationship like now, twenty years later? I I think we're friends for life. Uh, we I do. Too. Uh, yes. Yeah. Just. We're big fans. And, I mean, of Jack, it, Jack is such an amazing performer. And, you know, Coco and I sort of live in this world of drag, but Jack it lives in this whole other amazing world of, you know, uh, of acting because we, we, I don't know if we act, Coco. We do our show. So it's just, you know, I, I just love, you know, I'll just keep seeing Jack and stuff. And it, I just love that I keep seeing him. And, and, um, you know, even though I don't see Jack as much, I see Coco more because we perform together. I mean, I still feel like they're great friends. I love these men. I love these people so much. These men. The yeah, thing that I thought was funny too is that um, Coco fit and shows up on the first set and is expecting a, a, a video and there's a movie set there. And then the second movie <laughs> was just a video. It was just like, it was the, <laughs> the, the first one to be. <laughs> And in terms of the relationship, though, in the intervening years, Jack had gone on and um, directed his own movie and a play, and had become, you know, a, a very, very comfortable behind the camera. And and, and you know, th there was no more of uh, Clinton not knowing how to be on a set. I mean, she'd done all these other TV shows as well. So there are outtakes in the sequel. It's fun. I, only I get to see this material, but it's it'll be Clinton's close up. This happens a few times. And Jack is more or less giving line readings off camera. And Clinton is like, I know how to do it, Jack. You know? and, uh, it's like, I'm not, it's not, sometimes it's helpful. Or sometimes it isn't. It's just, it's just a hilarious relationship in and of itself. Nothing changes. <laughs> I just, Jack, I remember rehearsing with you in my apartment when we be, when we first did the skit. And I had like things laying on my little uh, coffee table. And you just picked up these little delicate things that I had and were like doing this with my, and I was like, what is he doing? And it, <laughs> so there's like a little bit of that inappropriateness of Evie in Jack and me just constantly like, feeling assaulted and uh, <laughs> <laughs> nervous and sort of on broken glass. And then once I got to know Jack, that it's like I learned how to celebrate that mm -hmm. and like almost encourage the bad behavior. Yeah. And I don't mean it bad behavior. I just I the eccentricities that we all three of us have. Good bad behavior. <clears throat> There's no one, there's no bigger pros than these two. Uh, I mean, they, they, they're just like, it's heaven being on set with you, with you guys. Oh. Curiosity, how long did, did uh, Girls Will Be Girls take to shoot? 18 days. 18 days, it was it consecutive, just back to back, you just shot it all out? Yeah, 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 we had, um, I think it was 18 shoot days. I might be off by like one or two, but yeah, because you, you got to hire the crew for like, whole blocks of weeks. And the Varla stuff was the most challenging because, I mean, Jeffrey was doing a show in San Francisco during the week and would do his Saturday show and then get on a plane, last one, I'm guessing, from San Francisco to LA and show up early. You know, was it Sunday morning was the first day we got you? We got you for like two days and then you had to go back and do next week's shows. So it was really just a lot of like filming out of sequence and putting Varla stuff in after the fact just because of her availability. That's so. So, how when when this movie is available on streaming, when and how is it released, and how can people get to, get it? iTunes and it'll be on Amazon. I mean, the usual places. I don't I don't know where else, but that's all you need. ITunes. That's all you need to know. Like iTunes, Amazon. If you don't have those, then you're not serious about content. <laughs> and, I, and I'm just assuming it's going to be. You turn on Amazon. There's a big splash page for Girls with the Girls, and then. You know, <laughs> If you don't want to watch that, it will go to the other stuff. I'm not, I'm not sure. 
I want to ask really quick, what, what drag movies, you know, what, the thing that makes Girls Will Be Girls very special is that they are impractical characters in a practical setting being played practically. They're not being played as outlandish performers. They live in a house and they're just struggling as girls. I mean, technically it is a drag movie, but do you think, what do you think the future is of drag movies? And do you think we'll see more that aren't necessarily about them being queens, but more just about them being women and happen to be played by men? Well, that's always been my favorite kind of drag. Charles Bush is one of my heroes. I love when, when an actor brings to life a complex female character and and uh, the way you described our film kept making me think of the Muppet movie and I guess in a oh. way it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well we had the Kermit rides the bicycle shot at the end where we see you head to toe naked just because <laughs> that's what they did in the Muppets movie they were like had Kermit on a bike so it's like there's no but there's no hand up his back you know he's the yeah, the, the moment when Evie stands completely naked and those breasts are hanging down to her waist. We did, we used to call it the Kermit rides the bicycle shot. Yeah. <laughs> what you hit upon, Brandon, there too, is like John Waters did this and Charles Bush does this and, and we do it. But I'm really surprised that most drag material on TV and in the movies is not about the character. It's always about mm -hmm. the drag queen doing drag and how that affects their life or how they affect a small town or whatever the hell, you know, even drag race, which, which is great, but it's about the act yeah. of doing drag yeah. more so than the performance, you know, after the fact. And I think that's the difference. And I hope there's more of that because, you know, people put so much work into these characters and I want to see the characters. I don't necessarily want to see them, you know, getting dressed for it. Right. What well, I love about what you do, Brandon, you, uh, you know, your female characters, they're, they're real, they're women. Well, I, they, well, I had, I had, you know, Girls Will Be Girls was a big influence of mine for many years and still is. But uh, I agree. I think that it, it, to just play a character normalizes it. You know, the less, like, can we just get over the fact that the, in a, he's in a dress and, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah, I said when RuPaul was on The Simpsons and whoever, you know, wrote that episode, it was all about like, they were drag queens waving rainbow flags and being very, and I was just like, you know, instead of just a role where RuPaul played a fee, even a female character, it was all about drag. And I just thought, I would love to just see a drag queen on something mainstream and it's not never acknowledged. It's just like, oh, she looks great, you know? Um, but, uh, and I think this movie is definitely, yeah, it's up there with John Waters in the sense that it normalizes female characters played uh, by men. Where, what do you think the future of uh, drag cinema is going? You know, since 20, 20 years ago, this came out, you know, with that hindsight, where do you think it's going onward? There's never been a present for drag cinema. You know, it's just, it's just if somebody wants to do it, they'll do it. But it's never, you don't get the sense that it's like, you know, horror movies or, or where there's a, a slice of the market just that is regularly being serviced with drag movies. Um, it would be great if there were. I mean, I, I don't know what the audience is for that. I mean, that's a good question. Or even who wants to make them. I love I love making them. <laughs> or you watching them. I love watching them. And take it. <laughs> Is there anything else that that you wanted to talk about uh, regarding uh, production or or the years that it's been out, how it's been received? I just remember when um, it came out in the theaters, how it wasn't like no one really went to see it. And we were disappointed. And actually, Charles Bush's film, Die, Mommy, Die, came out around the same time. And mm -hmm. th that sort of got a lot of attention because it was a drag movie. And ours sort of uh, just lost its whatever. And um, But then all of a sudden, I, I started to get emails from people in Australia who had gotten a hand their hands on a copy and or uh, emails from people who had decided to dress up as the three of us for Halloween. And that's how I started to learn like, oh, wow, this is actually becoming something now that it's on DVD. And so I'm hoping that now that it's going to be streaming, there's going to be this whole new generation of young people that discover a, a drag movie. And, um, and, and I remember when people first saw it, what they were surprised was that it looked beautiful. The acting was good. And they didn't expect that from a low budget drag movie. It surprised people. So I'm hoping it surprises a whole new generation of people who um, are looking for 
something that's a little wrong, very colorful, you know, all of what Richard, you know, envisioned and brought to the screen. No one writes a joke like Richard Day and 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 I agree with Coco it was it was marvelous when all of a sudden people were were coming up to me and quoting their favorite lines and asking me to uh, to call and leave a message on their friend's phone and say astrophysicist. Uh. And, uh, so it really it it has it took off in a way that none of us expected while we were nailing wood to Richard's walls, you know, and 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 putting on our our own, our own clothing to film a movie and. Uh, it was magical, and yes, it would be so wonderful to have a new generation discover it, since it's been sort of unattainable for the last decade. And well, only the... Richard, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, don't go ahead. I was just saying, only Richard can actually make you do things that you never thought you would do. <laughs> and like me getting pushed in a pool that day, it was like something I never, and, and when I, when I in, have the dream and I give birth to that baby, I was laying in bed for a long while with very stinky pig intestines. <laughs> and the, the room just, it was, I was gagging between sets and they were running, you know. And, but I thought, you know, you just do that for Richard. Uh, yeah. He has a way to make you just do that, those things. Yeah, you're on set and you're filming a scene and he comes up and he throws you a new line and you just, it's like, can I say that without laughing? It's just so, the joke will be so shocking and funny and perfect for the moment that, it, it, you know, you just try to get it all out without laughing. Richard, what was your writing process for this movie like? We went out for, as a TV pitch and Showtime bought it and Showtime didn't make pilots then. I think what they did was they, they might've also made pilots, but they bought two scripts from the pilot script and then a first episode. And so that's what I had written. And um, it wasn't a movie. It was just two, in the, you know, and I don't know what from those two things survived, but mm. a whole process happened after Showtime passed where we decided instead we were going to do a movie. And there was a window because, I mean, this was, like, I think we were already into the winter and mm. in the summer, that's when, you know, Coco and Barla are off, you know, making money. Um, and so, we had to shoot it by a certain date. And it was just a matter of taking that script and right. putting new stuff in and changing things around and getting it onto the set. I don't, you know, I, it wasn't a very considered piece of writing. I think that kind of helps. It's very, it's very, it, 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 because then the actors have to bring that to it. You know, I mean, if, if you have this absolutely airtight script that, you know, is, is dependent upon story, actors become these, puppets in it, but if it's more of a shaggy dog kind of thing like Girls with the Girls, it just gives everyone a chance to perform. And that wasn't necessarily intentional, but I think it, it helped a lot. It, you know, it made the movie have its charm. Richard, what what was the first, what was the moment you realized you had a cult following with this? You know, yeah. Because you're not, they're not quoting, they're not walking up to you in a cafe quoting something. So, so what, 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 what it, what was the moment that you were like, oh, people love this movie? Well, I don't, I think that the actors have a much better sense of that than I do because what it was when I would be out with Jack and people would come up to Jack and quote the lines. I mean, oh. like the thing is like the actors have a much better sense of that. No one comes up to me. I mean, you know, it's like they wouldn't know to in the first place, but they also aren't, you know, no one decided to meet the people behind the camera. Um, so that's how, when, when, when I would hear from Clinton and Jeffrey that, you know, people were doing that. And I saw it when I was with Jack, um, but it was invisible in terms of like direct impact on my life. Nothing, no, <laughs> maybe a little bit on Twitter, you know, but not even there. I was on a set of a sitcom and Jerry O'Connell said, you know, my wife, uh, Rebecca Romaine, she shows this to people to see if she wants to be friends with them. And I get that a lot where like, People feel like if you if if you don't find this really dark humor funny, then probably we're not going to be friends. I I love that. That tickles me so much. I'm, Rebecca Romain just went up in my book. I'm very happy. Oh, with I <laughs> <laughs> oh well, I uh, what, what what about you, uh, Marla? What what did you? What was what was your? Uh, Where's she going? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, I was on the chair and I was stuck to it. I don't have pants on. <laughs> I was stuck to it. 
But, but yeah. I remember, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, I did a show one time in New Orleans and someone, and the, the movie had just come out. And I went to see it in the theater and, you know, I loved it, but it, there weren't many people in there. And somebody after my show screamed, you know, Varla, we saw your movie today. We were the only people in the theater. You know? oh. <laughs> and then in, like about a year later in Provincetown, I'm walking down the street in drag, going to my show and someone drives by in a car and they threw a handful of candy at me and they said, take these for the ride, you huge cow. And at the time, you know, that's the line for the movie, but I, I couldn't remember. I hadn't seen the movie in a year. Oh. And I was like, how oh, mean, that's terrible. Why would someone do And then I, so I think it was actually Mark, my manager time, isn't that that line from the movie? And I thought, oh my God, I didn't even think of that. I just thought someone was being mean to me. And then it started to snowball from there where people would say the lines all the time. And then, you know, to see people dress as us for Halloween was pretty amazing. <laughs> Wow, that I didn't even think about that. Because the three of you yeah. have such distinct looks, it's it's not hard to clock who they're trying to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, ladies, so much for taking the time to talk with me and for having me be a part of this. And Girls Will Be Girls will be out streaming or should be out streaming currently when they see this uh, on Amazon, iTunes, and Vudu. Is that right? That's right. All right, all right. Well, I can't wait to finally show it to my, my friends whom I've described it front and back toward. I know it's going to live up. Um, and, I know uh, my husband hasn't seen it yet, so I want my husband to see it. I know. We don't have a DVD player. You might not know if you and your husband are, are friend compatible. <laughs> 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 <laughs>